What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with hogsports.com, H-A-W-G sports.com. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the Arkansas versus Missouri State game. Curtis Wilkerson is going to join us to talk a little bit about that and provide some basketball insight as well. It's been a little bit since we've had Curtis Wilkerson on the show. And I'm also going to bring in Keith Grayson, who I think will provide a unique fan perspective about Bobby Petrino's time at Arkansas as we get ready for this Arkansas-Missouri State game. So this is your Arkansas versus Missouri State primer. And before we get started, I want to remind you there's plenty of ways to watch and listen. You can always tune in on Facebook Live. Be sure to throw us a like, follow the page, become one of 90,000 Razorback fans to do so, and also available on YouTube. Throw us a thumbs up on YouTube, interact with the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell so you're alerted anytime we upload new videos. Also available on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate the surge of five-star reviews that have been coming our way lately. So leave us a review if you haven't done so already. Make it five stars. We'd certainly appreciate that. Also available on Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere else you can think of to find your favorite podcast and hog sports is just one dollar right now for your first month at hawg sports.com fantastic time to sign up at hog sports okay Arkansas versus Missouri State. Missouri State is ranked number five in the country on the FCS level, not the FBS. Arkansas is number 10 on the FBS level, according to the Associated Press. This is a 6 o'clock game on Saturday, September 17th on SEC Network Plus or ESPN Plus. I'll put a video up later in the day uh, just for anybody that's confused on how that service works and how to access the show. So we'll get a video up there and I'll put it on our how to watch uh, show that we uh, or how to watch story that we do every week also in addition to all the radio stations and, and all of that stuff. So we'll get all that information for you. Make sure that you're good to go and not confused on on any of the stuff that's coming up. So I guess log on later, or get your notifications sent up so you'll know uh, how to do that. Uh, Arkansas injury report so far looks like Dominic Johnson's probably going to play. He's been cleared for a while. He's kind of gone through a progression of you know right after spring or excuse me right after fall camp. He was in a green no contact jersey, still had a brace on his knee. Then a couple of weeks ago, uh, he shed the green no contact jersey and was live for contact, but still had a brace on his knee. And then uh, for a while now, he's had no brace at all, uh, not at all this week. So. I would think he's ready to go. Uh, you may say hold him till Texas A&M, but I think get him some hits. Let him get tackled to the ground. Let him know that that knee's going to be okay. I mentioned this on drive time yesterday, but I can remember when Traylon Burks was a freshman. I think it was a punt return or something, but he took a shot on the knee, and I remember he went down and started grabbing his knee and rolling around, and everybody was just like, oh, no. But he was fine. It was just the first time he'd taken a shot, you know, first time he'd been hit on the knee and was concerned, was worried about it. But after that, obviously, he was trailing Burks. So something like that, obviously, I'm not saying take a shot on the knee, but, you know, just getting hit, just knowing that you're going to be okay. You know, in most cases, you are going to be okay. And the predominant huge percentage, you're going to be okay. It's just mental of getting over that. I think Dominic Johnson looks pretty good. He was a little bit heavy when he first got back to practice, about 247. You could tell. You could tell also that he's trimmed up a little bit. But he's an important guy to get into the mix because, you know, A.J. and and Rashad, you know, those guys are quicker backs. They got some power too. They got some pop, but not like Dominic. Dominic and Rocket are the guys that really provide some pop. And as we saw in the last game, you know, Dominic – or excuse me, uh, uh, Rocket had – 27 touches, which is probably a little bit too much for him. Uh, 27 touches, you could tell he started getting gas there at the end. So, But Dominic is a guy that you could feel good about coming in and taking over the role and, and moving the pile and keeping the chains moving, uh, which, I mean, the dude always falls forward. So, obviously uh, a key, you know, situation to watch there with Dominic. How much action will he get? Uh, obviously, Jalen Catalan is, is done for the season. We've known that for a while now. Um, Latavius Brini, Trey Knox, expecting both those guys to play based on what we've seen in practice too. So, And, you know, we'll see on Miles Slusher. He hasn't not been out there, but we'll see on Miles Slusher. I think they could probably mix some things up, moving Miles Slusher to uh, middle safety. They talked about moving Kari Johnson to the boundary slash – uh, nickel spot, you know, kind of in a backup role. Uh, I think that's probably what you could see. I think it makes sense to put Miles Slusher back at middle safety, which is what he did last year when Jalen Catalan was hurt last year. So, Obviously, you'd like to, you know, 
this is an important game, so you'd like to take care of business early, get out of there, get your back up some work, and then think about this stretch coming up with Texas A&M, Alabama, Mississippi State, BYU, all before the bye week. That's a critical stretch, and you want to make sure you're as healthy as possible going into it. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Arkansas baseball released its 2023 uh, schedule. Uh, the first thing that they'll do is the college baseball showdown on February 17th through 19th. Be nice and chilly for that. Three-day tournament at the home of the Texas Rangers will feature fellow SEC members Vanderbilt and Missouri, as well as Big 12 foes Oklahoma State, Texas, and TCU. Arkansas's matchups have not yet been announced. The first home game is February 21st against Grambling. First SEC home game is March 17th through 19th with the South Carolina series. And you can read all of that on hogsports.com. Andrew Ellis has put all that together for you nice and neat. Bobby Petrino returning for the first time since he was fired in disgrace. I, I said last week, you know, I'm not a big fan of like the neck braces and all that stuff. You know, I don't find, you know, it may have been funny to me at a time, but now I just look back at it and it's like, wow, what a dark period for Arkansas football from the time that that happened on. And I'm not saying it was all just because Bobby Petrino, Arkansas obviously made some terrible hires during that stretch also. You know, they made better hires than, than maybe things would have worked out. But Arkansas back on top again for the first time since those times. I remember those were really good times. I mean, uh, up until the part where, you know, the motorcycle, and I know there's all kinds of conspiracy theories. I think it's interesting that people build conspiracy th theories on top of what was already a conspiracy, <laughs> you know. Like, we know what happened, but it's interesting that people uh, come up with, with different ideas of what might have happened and kind of run with it. So is Arkansas ready to face this offense? What, what I know about Bobby Petrino's offense is they like to do things that the odds, like most people would say, you know, that's not what you would do there. But Petrino looks at it and says, hey, you know, this makes all the sense in the world. And so many times it paid off. I mean, I can remember a couple times against LSU. Remember the Joe Adams catch late in that game. Uh, what they, you know, something that they did the year before and they applied it to this game. I can also remember, you know, the Cowboy go get it play against Louisiana Monroe. I think somebody else they did that too. You know, the, the miracle on Markham, I think, is a prime example of the things that Bobby Petrino will do on offense that you wouldn't expect. So you're watching that game, the clock is ticking, you know, 30 seconds, 29 seconds, the clock's going down. Arkansas is fourth and one at their own, or excuse me, at the LSU 24 yard line. We know what happens, but we're just going to recap it a little bit. Fourth and one at the 24, and, you know, even the announcer right before the ball snap, don't worry about the time, just get the first down. Well, that's not what Petrino was thinking. He was thinking, okay, we've got the safeties over on this side, or excuse me, the corners over on this side of the field and press man. This is probably the last time we'll get press man. You know, the rest of the time they're just going to be backed up, preventing you from trying to score in the end zone because you had to have a touchdown. So what does he decide to do? Last time that we're going to get the the corners, you know, cheated up real close. So we're going to throw it deep. And London Crawford runs a go route, and Casey Dick hits him in stride perfectly. Touchdown, Arkansas, and they win the game. And throughout the next several years at Arkansas, the next three after that, and, you know, that year too, we saw Petrino make – play calling decisions that change the game and I'm sure he's doing that at Missouri State obviously they're having probably more success than they've ever had at their program they're ranked number five nationally so we'll see that again what I'm thinking kind of you know I don't think that we'll just see an all-out blowout in this one I think we're kind of seeing a trend with some SEC schools where you know they just kind of get in and get out uh, I could see maybe where it gets to like 42 10 or something heading into the fourth quarter. I mean, that's a lot of points. The line is 28 and a half. And you go to a 12-minute final quarter or something like that. We've seen that. We saw Arkansas do that in the second half on both quarters against UAPB when the game was completely out of hand. Um, and then I could see, you know, something like a 45-17, something like that. Maybe them getting a, a, a late score and Arkansas getting a field goal or something like that and maybe a backdoor cover or something. That's kind of what I'm thinking. And the reason we, I was talking with Andrew Ellis about this, like there's a ridiculous level that – Petrino's, or excuse me, that uh, that uh, Pittman's teams are covering the spread right now. And so we're trying to, like, find something to balance it out. So we're thinking maybe this game will help balance it out to where they're just not dominating uh, the point spread in, in game after game. So um, maybe this is the game where there's a backdoor cover or something like that by Missouri State when Arkansas has a lot of the backups in.
All right. We're going to jump right in with Curtis now. So for those of you who don't follow Curtis Wilkerson, where's your graphic, Curtis? Here we go. For those of you who don't follow Curtis Wilkerson, does a great job covering Razorback sports. Got a real itch on my nose right now. Okay, let's see. Curtis, Curtis, where you at? All right, so Curtis Wilkerson, uh, for those of you who don't follow him, you can follow him at Kurt Wilkerson underscore on Twitter. Does a fantastic job covering. He's our primary basketball guy, but also chips in on everything and does a great job covering hey, football as well. Hey, Curtis, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. I've got a hellacious nose itch right now that I'm trying to get to while I got your graphic up. <laughs> so um, I've been dealing with it like literally since I started the show. So, um, Curtis, how you been, man? I mean, you're married now. So a lot of people probably wonder why you haven't been on the show yet, but you went to Virginia and got hitched. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like a new person. You know, honestly, I was just driving a couple weeks ago on that Thursday. I was kind of waiting around, expecting a call to be on the show, but, you know, it never happened. So I, I thought maybe I was getting replaced there, but I'm <laughs> definitely glad to be back on today. And so far, the married life has treated me well. Yeah, well, I, I battled the decision back and forth. And I was like, well, maybe we should let Curtis just be free on his honeymoon. <laughs> It was a tough decision. <laughs> well, congratulations to you, Curtis, and uh, we're certainly happy for you and Michelle. Um, thank you, thank you. And uh, the many years to come. I mean, uh, it's a, a great story with you two. You guys have been together for a long time, so I'm glad everything worked out and went smoothly there in Virginia. And we'll get the, we'll get the present over to you. I haven't I haven't gone through the your registry yet, but I know I'm late on that. But we'll get to it. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate it. I mean, we've been together for eight years already, so it, I guess it's only ceremoniously different. But, yeah, you know, as far as the present's concerned, we've pretty much got our entire kitchen re-outfitted, which is nice. exciting. So, I, I don't know, maybe you can keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah, maybe we'll think outside <laughs> the kitchen then. So, Cur <laughs> Curtis, uh, you we always do the, uh, you know, offense versus defense, defense versus offense, and, and this year you've been taking a look at the opponent defenses versus Arkansas's offense. What are you seeing with Missouri State? I know everybody's focused on the offense and Bobby Petrino, but what are you seeing with these guys on, on the defensive side of the ball? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for their level, uh, they're, they're really pretty good. I know they've given up some points. They gave up 30 last week to UT Martin. Uh, struggled a little bit in the passing game. Gave up over 340 yards through the air. Uh, you know, against Tennessee Martin last week, they do have uh, some playmakers, though, back there in the secondary. A couple of preseason um, All-Americans at the FCS level that I think are really good players in Kyrie McDonald and Montre Braswell. So, you know, a couple guys back there to be aware of. And, you know, they set a record, a program record last year with 30 sacks as a team. Uh, they, they do a pretty good job of getting pressure off the edge and in the interior. And they've been off to a good start so far this season. But, I, I mean, I think the overall theme when you look at it, uh, as good as these guys are at their level, well, Arkansas is just bigger at, at mm -hmm. all positions. You know, and I was kind of looking at, you know, Rocket there, such a big running back, 6'2", 227 pounds. Well, he's bigger than every one of the linebackers for Missouri State. That doesn't mean those guys aren't talented and they can't play, but there's just a difference there. Yeah. And, you know, the same thing with the defensive ends. Uh, some of these guys, Kevin Ellis is a guy that's, that's really talented, gets in the backfield all the time. Uh, K.J. Jefferson's bigger than him. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if, if Arkansas comes out and handles their business, avoids the self-inflicted wounds with penalties, uh, you know, any turnovers, which they've been really good about, they should be able to just line up and, and run it right at them and, and pretty much score at will. Uh, but, you know, stranger things have happened. You know, it's not – Bobby Petrino's only – it's not just his homecoming. Um, you know, his his son, Nick Petrino, uh, is offensive coordinator there. Um, you've got Tremaine Thomas, who is a former Razorback, who's the cornerbacks coach for the Bears. Reggie Johnson, maybe a familiar name if people remember the linebackers coach at Arkansas while Petrino was there. Uh, L.D. Scott was, uh, was an intern with Arkansas defensive tackle. So, a lot of familiar faces uh, come in here uh, for Arkansas as well. Yeah, that's wild to think about. I know, yeah. you know, a lot of those guys were, uh, you know, with Petrino when he was at Arkansas and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, the more I think about it, I guess the more it makes sense. You know, Springfield's not that far away from Fayetteville. And if you have a, you know, a, a pseudo Arkansas connection in Petrino there in place of the head coach, I, I guess it kind of makes sense. You know, guys who are familiar with the area have probably recruited down here before. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a pretty interesting dynamic there. It, it does make sense, but it is kind of crazy just the volume of Arkansas connections that are there. Mm -hmm. 
I loved your subhead, by the way, when you're talking about uh, Rocket Sanders versus the linebackers and, and the size difference. What happens when a rocket meets a bear? <laughs> That's I'm glad one, I was proud of that. I'm glad one of your you better it. efforts. Yeah, yeah. Good <laughs> job you. on that. Um, how do you see this one playing out, Curtis? I know I've given my prediction. I think you just put yours in the prediction, which, which we run Friday morning every week. How do you see this one playing out? Yeah, I mean, I just I feel like this Arkansas team is is focused. They're locked in. Obviously, they're saying all the right things. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, listen. We know Bobby Petrino is a he's a he's a strong offensive mind. He's got some good players, and he's got a, a really solid quarterback there in Shelley. I think he's got some nice weapons there at the skill positions. So, you know, will they hit a big player too, and, and you know, probably probably score a few points? Yeah, I, I could see them doing that. But at the end of the day. Uh, I just see Arkansas dominating in the churches on both sides of the ball. Like I said, I, I think Arkansas, you know, as long as they avoid stepping on their own toes, they should mm-hmm. be able to move the ball successfully and, and score at will. Sam Pittman doesn't really strike me as the type of guy to, to run up a score. I, I think Arkansas, you know, might be able to do that if they really wanted to. But, uh, no, I, I think Arkansas is going to get control of this one early. And, you know, maybe it's an opportunity for us to see some of the backups and, you know, new faces that we're excited about for the future. And, and I, I think. My final prediction, I want to say it was 49-14, to 14, so I, I got Arkansas winning handily. Yeah. We always ask five burning questions and list keys to victory and stuff. One of yours is what type of welcome will Petrino receive? I think it was 60% in the poll that Andrew Ellis did, 60% of the people said that they would – uh, cheer for Petrino when he, you know, and and uh, another forty percent or so said that they would boo him. So I mean, that's or maybe maybe wouldn't be. I can't remember, but there was enough people I thought that said they would boo him that we, I think we probably expect them. So, but they boo, they boo the opposing team when they come out the the tunnel anyway. So you probably won't even be able to distinguish it. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I I think that's just part of being an opponent coming into Donald W. Reynolds Razorback Stadium, You're mm-hmm. right? And I, you know, maybe if this game was a few years ago, um, or if, you know, if Arkansas was still kind of in the basement, maybe it would be a different story, and, and people would still maybe you know cast some of the blame on Petrino or, or that era or the regime that was in charge. But you know, more than a decade has passed. I mean, I was in college when all this was going down. This feels like forever ago. And, uh, you know, Arkansas now under Sam Pittman, they've kind of really turned things around. They're back to where they were, mm-hmm. uh, you know, before the things went off the rails there with Petrino. So uh, maybe that combination of time and just the program seeing more success has, has kind of eased any of those wounds that were left over. And um, I don't expect them to give the man a standing ovation or anything like that, but I, I don't think it'll be overly uh, hostile, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to, for clarification, that was Danny who ran the poll, and it was 63.4% said they would not boo him, and 36.6% said they would uh, boo him. Nobody, There wasn't an option for will you cheer for him or not. So I guess if everybody was silent, then you'll just hear boos. Uh, Curtis's other questions are, will the Hogs tighten the screws in the secondary? Is it time for Arkansas to air it out? Can Arkansas keep up a steady pass rush? Will any new faces shine for the Razorbacks? Definitely possible. And then the keys to victory are always the same. Turnovers, penalties, special teams, and injuries. Obviously, it played a bit of a role for Arkansas. And then number five, which you talked about already, take control early. Um, We're not going to go over all this stuff. Obviously, everybody can read that on hogsports.com. I did want to get to you on basketball. Arkansas uh, announces the SEC basketball schedule. I don't think that there's any coincidence that the last game before the SEC tournament, March 4th, is versus Kentucky. Yeah, I mean, that is awesome. I, I heard some rumblings that that might be the case before it came out, and I'm really glad that, that wound up being true. Uh, I mean, you just can't ask for a, a better game, a better setting to wrap up the regular, regular season. I mean, these are two teams. You look at all the polls, uh, pretty much consistently top ten, maybe even top five and some. So you're looking at, you know, maybe the regular season SEC crown could be decided on that day in Bud Walton Arena if everything shakes out. I, I think that would be awesome. Uh, you know, obviously Kentucky's got Oscar Shibwe, the, the reigning national player of the year, coming back, and, and we know that Arkansas's got a loaded squad. So uh, it's going to be really cool to see. It, it, it's a it's a tough slate, though. You know, you take a look at it, uh, especially down the stretch. We remember all those quad one games for Arkansas at the end of last season. It just felt like the month of February was brutal. Uh, and, you know, and you kind of look at that last week, and it's like, okay, um, we got a Saturday trip to Alabama, who's a, obviously a projected NCAA tournament team. A uh, short turnaround for a Tuesday at Tennessee and Knoxville, where Arkansas lost last year, and then wrapping up with Kentucky. So, uh, some some tough games in there. 
and Arkansas has to go to Auburn. They don't get the return game at home, so that kind of stinks. And then, you know, you don't really get a break in there. The SEC Big 12 Challenge, you're at Baylor, mm-hmm. uh, who's probably a, you know, a projected Final Four team. So in terms of schedules overall, and, and we're still waiting for the last couple non-conference games to be announced, but we know about the Maui Invitational and things like that, uh, this is by far the most challenging schedule that Eric Musselman's put together since he arrived at Arkansas. And, you know, I, I think fortunately for him, he's, he's probably got his best team as well. So it's going to be really interesting interesting to see how it all plays out so what's going on right now with Razorback basketball recruiting Curtis it's a lot of things you know it's it's unbelievable it, it, you know on Friday the recruiting period opened back up which meant you know coaches were able to get back out on the road uh, and start seeing you know their their priorities visiting guys at you know their open gyms or practices things of that nature uh, man, I, I don't know how many coaches they have on the road. Apparently, it's you know only their core four, but they're everywhere. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the must bus literally never stops rolling. It's insane. Uh, they really put an emphasis on Texas, uh, which is fascinating. You know, you got Jordan Walsh and Anthony Black, a pair of five stars out of there last year. They're really trying to plant that Razorback flag in Texas. Uh, you know, the 2023 class, a couple high priority targets in Ron Holland, uh, five star. He was teammates with Black at Duncanville. Arkansas has been out to see him twice. Wesley Yates, another guard in that 2023 class, a high four-star uh, out of Beaumont. Arkansas has been out to see him. And then in 2024, uh, I started to look ahead at some of those names, those long uh, athletic guards, you know, f- you know, five-star, high four-star guys like a Trey Johnson out of Lake Highland. He was just named the number one player in the country uh, in the 2024 rankings update yesterday. Arkansas has been out to see him a couple times. Dink Pate. Uh, out of Pinkston, a 6'8 point guard. He's got a great relationship with Anthony Black, kind of looks up to him as one of those big point guards. Arkansas has been out to see him a couple times. So uh, heavy on Texas. They've been out in the in the Alabama, Atlanta area the last couple days uh, checking in on LeBaron Phylon, a four-star point guard today. Uh, if, if Phylon sounds like a familiar last name, it should. Uh, Cousins with Darius. So uh, some connections there. But, yeah, Arkansas has been all over the place. Um, you know, getting some visitors lined up to come onto campus, and it's uh, it's just a never-ending deal. There's no off season with Arkansas basketball, and that goes especially true with recruiting. Yeah, you just mentioned Phylon. He's listed as the number four, excuse me, number forty national uh, player in the class of 2024. This list was just released with uh, 2024 all the way out. I think we just had. I don't think we had a full 150 on our previous ranking, and now we have the full 150. And there are 12 players with an Arkansas offer that are listed uh, I mean this is these I think I mean I say it's a 150 but all these guys that are offered are all within the top 54 players in the country yeah it's it's nuts you know they don't mess around and I think it's pretty impressive and if you kind of look at the way uh, maybe the basketball landscape or, or really college athletics as a whole is changing uh, with the transfer portal and, and some of the things that go on there with you know the one-time eligibility waivers and, and what have you uh, you know, if you're in a position like Arkansas where you can compete on the recruiting trail with the Blue Bloods, you know, the Kentuckys, Kansases, Dukes of the world, and Musselman's proven he can do that at this point, well, why not set your standards high and, and you know, go for some of these guys who you feel mm-hmm. can come in right away and make an immediate impact. And you know what? You, maybe you don't get every single one of them. Musselman's proven he can get most. Uh, but if you miss, it's, it's certainly easy to go and, and backfill through the portal with experience. So I think they've got a really nice system going on here you know we saw six high school guys and five transfers uh, coming into this season I, miss, I think ideally you'd probably like to have more returners but Musselman kind of likes to wipe that slate clean from time to time so I don't think a big roster turnover worries him uh, we'll see what they do with the 2023 class I, I wouldn't be surprised if they get to four uh, maybe five if they, if they decide they want to stretch it out with that 2023 group and you know they'll be active in the portal again and, and then obviously moving forward they've already got 12 offers out to 2024 and if you look below on that story at the interest uh, there's a lot of guys who are really high on the Razorbacks when you talk to them. I imagine they're going to have some more offers going out here pretty soon. Curtis Wilkerson joining us. Again, you can follow Curtis at Kurt Wilkerson underscore. I've got you listed as Hog Sports contributor on your byline here, which is ridiculous because you do so much more than that, covering the whole landscape of Razorback uh, sports, football, basketball, baseball, helping on all those things. But the main basketball guy, but Del, obviously, as you can see, does a lot of great work in football stuff too. So if you want to follow Curtis, sign up at hawgsports.com. It's just $1 right now for your first month. Curtis, anything else you want to chime in on before, we head, before, you, uh, before you head out? Any last words of wisdom? 
Man, I got nothing. I, I think we covered a lot there. I feel good about it. I feel pretty good about it too, Curtis. All right, brother. We'll see you on Saturday up in the press box. Be glad to have you back with us. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. All right. Bye, Curtis. All right, everybody. That's Curtis Wilkerson. Again, follow him at Kurt Wilkerson underscore. Uh, just does a fantastic job for us over at Hog Sports. Luckily have, lucky to have Curtis, and certainly congratulations to him and his wife, Michelle. All right. We're going to go to my man Keith Grayson now. We haven't had Keith on for a while. He's been busy, too. I mean, Keith has got a new member of the Grayson family. I mean, super busy. All right. Let's see. Where are you at, Keith? What's up, Trey? How you doing, Keith? It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. You sure do give a lot of airtime to a guy that uh, plans a fall wedding. <laughs> that's true. He gets married on a game day and is in sports writing. Yeah, that's true. Well, it was the only opportunity, I think, for them to get the venue that they wanted. He actually got married on a Sunday, at least, so um, not on a, on a college football Saturday, which is that and kids' birthdays are right up there with the uh, number one killer of your college football Saturday. Uh, speaking of life changes, uh, Keith, you've had a lot. I mean, you're married recently. You got a baby. Uh, how's everything going with the family? Well, unlike Curtis, my priorities are football, family, faith. So <laughs> um, I'm I'm all in on football right now. I don't even know my kid's name. So uh, <laughs> now, little little Jet's doing all right. He's he's babbling at two months. Uh, the you know the first. Um, I'm probably an older dad. I'm, I just turned 41 the other day and, um, kind of going through this. I haven't been around kids a lot, mm-hmm. um, or small children anyway in my, in my life and never really even held a baby and, um, caught a jet stream in the eye the other day, changing a diaper. So that was kind of a, set me back a mm-hmm. little bit. That might, um, be a, that might be a good nickname for him. Jet stream all the well it's hopefully it's jet sweep but um, <laughs> i'm surprised you weren't able to push through darren mcfadden grayson i thought that was the plan I, I, I to be honest it was bua oh bua but, yeah <laughs> gotcha. bua grayson but we can always nickname him yeah so uh for those of you who aren't familiar with keith we've had him on the show before um high school coach real estate Razorback fan, does just about everything uh, out there in, in Arizona, but he is a, an Arkansas native and, and a diehard hog fan. So, Keith, um, you have an, a good perspective of the Bobby Petrino years. Some some may say you were peaking back in that uh, that era. Uh, I can always remember the uh, the Cotton Bowl, uh, the, the experience that you had. What do you remember about Bobby Petrino, and, and what are your thoughts with him returning to Fayetteville now? I think during the time frame that – um, a lot of people, fans in particular, want to say that he was like have this idea that he was like this rude person or something, just because yeah. of like how he left the Falcons and there were some things that came out like kind of. He's a hard coach to play for, you know. I'm buddies with Alonzo Highsmith out here. We just played them in a scrimmage three weeks ago or four weeks ago, and uh, Kelvin Fisher works at my real estate firm. So I mean, we have some Petrino connections out here. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, I. Uh, I think there's a misconception that he's this hard guy to get along with. And every time I met him, he remembered who I was. He's kind of like Pittman in the, in the regard that like, he's really easy to talk to. If you're a fan kind of like, I I just don't think that um, he's just highly competitive. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know how that translates on TV. You know, when he's cussing out Les miles for throwing fades up 35 points in the fourth quarter, um, he, he has, he has his shortcomings like everybody. Yeah. Um, and I think that at the time when we had 21 wins in two seasons and it was high cotton, we were, everybody was like all in and it was it, every, every Saturday was a party. And, and, and also like, you never felt like you were going to lose a game. And mm-hmm. if you turn around now, that's the same sentiment. And that's, that's the same feeling I, I have with Sam Pittman. And the, the other thing is, you know, Petrino is a schematic master, uh, and he's a game planner. And, um, and just look at Nick Saban's folder that he has on him. There was some SEC story thing where they're in Saban's office, and he has an Arkansas playbook, like an Arkansas notepad that is four times larger than any other teams. Mm-hmm. And when, when in 2011 when they were playing each other. So I think that one of his shortcomings was recruiting, and 
everybody knew that at the time. And it was just kind of like, man, if we can get some sort of wave of momentum nationally and build the brand, the recruits will just show up because of how awesome Fayetteville is. And once they get there, but they, I don't think they were doing everything they could in that regard. And now we have schematic geniuses and Barry Odom and Kendall Bryles and with the recruiting of Sam Pittman, and Sam Pittman knows more football than people give him credit for. Um, I think he's on the cutting edge of a lot of stuff. So we get the best of both worlds with Pittman. Yeah. And I think when it's it's kind of a weird relationship dynamic of like you're kind of seeing your ex in, at a restaurant with somebody else, mm-hmm. um, but you've leveled up. <laughs> I do I do think that the commonality is, you know, so much, you know, the face of the program that, you know, Pittman is and that Petrino was. Uh, I felt like if if you remove Pittman or Petrino from the equation, then you lose a lot. But with Petrino, it was – he was everything. He had his finger on every single thing, whereas Pittman seems like more of a delegator, uh, obviously, with his coordinators and such. And maybe that carries over with recruiting with Petrino because he did have his finger on everything and, you know, not super personable and probably not that great a recruiter, whereas Pittman, you know, obviously is a, is a fantastic, uh, fantastic recruiter. Um so yeah, uh, well, I knew you'd have a, a good perspective on on just those years, and I remember them very well too. But I, like I said, I, you were kind of peaking that that Cotton Bowl uh, game where you made it onto the field and and snuck into the the media area and everything's pretty legendary. Yeah, me and Jericho Nelson were, and you were like, on the screen. The, you were on the big screen there. Uh, yeah, the jumbotron. Me and I watched the game with Felix Jones and DJ Williams, and then. Uh, and then we had Joe Nichols coming down and security wouldn't let him pass the door. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was down there with no ticket, but you know, me and Jericho and Nelson were s- slamming that sledgehammer into the doors and stuff at the Cowboy stadium. I mean, it was awesome. So, yeah. and, and that was, that was kind of the pinnacle. And then after that, it just kind of, everything dissipated. That, yeah. So that, that was the peak. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like the, the message board was just getting going and stuff and, and pre Twitter, Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that have on social media now that have some sort of clout that had at the time, like not to, not to have a big head about it or be cocky, but I was way more famous than these idiots on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> you are, you're a famous fan. No question about it. Keith Grayson joining just, us. I, I've got your old, buddies, tw- I've got I, your old what? Twitter account on here, but we haven't. Go ahead, you were going to tell a story. I was going to get into forty twenty five. I don't really have that. Man, yeah, my Twitter's. It, I, I can't say anything that I want because the school district follows me now. But at, so in on on the hogs, I just got a call from one of my buddies one time. He's like, "Dude, we had a staff meeting at Cruz and Associates, mm-hmm. and they were reading your like blog about the Cotton Bowl, and everybody's laughing about it. Mm-hmm. Like they would read." these things like in their, in their sales meetings. And yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was just, it was fantastic. You know. and, and just to tell the story, I know you hate when I refer to you as the disgraced former founder and president of the Arizona Razorback club, but you were dismissed from the club that you founded and presided over as president over your experience at the cotton bowl, which I thought was just legendary fan material. Yeah, that didn't do anything wrong. They just said that I, I basically said something uh, discrediting the Dallas chapter, which it's, it is the Dallas. There's in the alumni association you go to some of these parties in some of these cities, yeah. specifically da- Dallas. It's a bunch of blue hairs, and it's like not fun, you yeah. know. And we're trying to like live it up. And I don't want to go to a Mexican restaurant and listen to Frank Sinatra and eat like some like it was just a bunk party. And then and I called him out on it, and that was a one sentence of the thing. And mm-hmm. I was like, it felt like I was in the middle of a. Like a set of like I was on the set of Cocoon, and that's the reference that I made. And so then apparently that got <laughs> President Gerhardt involved in my dismissal from the, anything that had the University of Arkansas on it. Well, screw all those people. Well, yeah, that was that was an interesting time. <laughs> and I'm the least anti. Well, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm the most anti-authority person. Like if somebody tells me I can't do oh. something, then I just double down on it. <laughs> Dear Lord, that is the truth. I've learned that myself. Speaking um, of which, like you told me, I could never be, you would never have a guest on the walk and talk, and I could never crash it. And I, yeah. I abide by that rule, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have that weird Ace and Gary moment with you and Josh Pate. It yeah. was I had to take several showers. It was very creepy. <laughs> well, I have I have since considered like if I ever had another one, then uh, then you would be it, okay, Keith? 
I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to show up on one of those scooters and crash into you. That's fine. That would make for good, good viewership. But it's, it's, it was Josh Pate's too, he's too professional. Josh Pate's a great dude. Does a fantastic job. I was happy to have him. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was different, obviously, because it's usually just, you, you know, and it was just for a couple of minutes, you know. It was just I know a, you have, like, other family and stuff, but you give an only child vibe, mm-hmm. and you could tell you did not want to share the spotlight. It was on your face. That's not true. I have three <laughs> sisters. I've been sharing everything my entire life. <laughs> what else, What do you think about this season, Keith? How do you, I mean, is it playing out like you thought it would? What game are we scared of? Who are we? There's people in this thread right now. I'm watching on Facebook Live before you call. They're like, this game worries me. Shut up. What are you talking about? <laughs> Why? We're going to mow them down. We're going to run for 350 yards. Willie Robinson ain't coming out of that door to shut us down. <laughs> uh, he's in Holmboat County. Look up. Where is Willie Robinson? Exactly. Where is Willie? He's, he's growing cannabis. That's what he did after he got let like, go to Arkansas. But anyway. Yeah, right. So. I um, yeah. No, we're Allegedly, I don't know that for sure. So if Willie is listening, I don't know. I'm saying his facts. It's Keith Grayson is putting it on uh, on uh, record. So hey, to to stay on topic though, to mm-hmm. quit talking about stuff that doesn't matter. I, we're gonna <laughs> go into every game expecting a win. I'm trying to. The, the hardest thing for me to do right now is I got to coach on a Friday night mm-hmm. and I got to make it to. Uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas for the Bama game. How the hell can I do that? I'm looking at tickets like I have no idea how to get there. Yeah, that's going to be a difficult one. On a Saturday. One. I can't go on a Friday. Friday is no question. But if, if anybody's listening that has a, a Gulf Stream, I can borrow for mm-hmm. like a, a, a heavy discount. Man, I need, a, I need a private jet, Keith. I mean, I need something like – like getting to Starkville, Mississippi, there's just no, I hate driving like from years of childhood trauma of driving back and forth from Georgia to visit, you know, my, my, I'm a child of divorce. My dad lived in Georgia, my mom in Arkansas. So I have like trauma from driving too long and there's no good way to get to Starkville, Mississippi. It's just, it's going to be an eight hour drive. And I just think about boys with Blake Eddins and he can like hook up some sort of Stevens thing. Blake Eddins and I've had like two conversations lifetime. So if you're listening, Blake, I'd like to get to know you. If you I have gave a, him a, if you have a jet. I, sent, I got I got his home address somehow, and I sent him a KJ Jefferson family shirt. Mm-hmm. And all I ask in return is the Stevens jet for that Bama weekend. Yeah, to and from Scottsdale. So if anybody's listening out there, Keith Grayson or me, we would love to ride in your jet to Starkville, Mississippi, or Clay Henry gets to do it all the time. What's Auburn. Up with that? Auburn's also a terrible one. I, I don't think so. That's the thing that like first turned me on because I remember I was I was in. Columbia, South Carolina one year, and this is back when they had the Stevens jet and they would fly, you know, use the Stevens jet to fly everywhere. And I'm sitting there and I had a miserable travel experience. I'd arrived the day before, you know, had to get a rental car, had to check into a hotel, all that stuff. And then I see the Stevens jet flying in. I could see it from the press box on, going on. the. There's a landing strip nearby the stadium. I could see it landing and flying in. And then a little while later, I see all those guys come in and sit down. And then at the after the game, they all look at each other and go, y'all, y'all just want to finish this up on the jet? And I'm sitting there thinking, I've got to stay another day. I've got to get up at the crack of dawn in the morning, you know, to, to fly out of Columbia and stuff. And I was, it was super jealous ever since and have wanted to fly, uh, especially with the way commercial flight is right now with everything getting canceled. I had two flights get just straight up canceled over the summer. Um, but, yeah, if anybody's out there who's got a business or something wants me to promote it, I'll talk about it on here if you'll fly me. I will do that. I'll even drive to Little Rock if you're flying out of Little Rock. Or you can- yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, anyway, man. Good luck on me, on finding somebody in Phoenix that will fly you to the Alabama game. I'm sure it will work out. You have a way of, of figuring things out like that. I just put it – it's a law of attraction, man. I put things in the universe and it kind of comes back. There you go. Well, all right, Keith, I appreciate you coming on. It's been a while. Thanks for having me on. I miss you. I love you. I don't know what happened with us, but we haven't talked in a long time. So. <laughs> well, you had a lot of stuff going on. I mean, you got a wife and a kid now. That's a lot. That's never stopped me before. Has it? You haven't had that before. <laughs> How can you compare that to anything? That's why. I mean, that's what. Did I lie just now? Yes, that's why. I never saw you before. It sounded good. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll see you for Alabama. Maybe we can get together and have a beer or something. That'd be nice. I, I want Bama. I, I really want Bama. Okay. 
I'm going to start yelling it. I would yell it, but I know your listeners don't want to hear me scream, I want Bama. I want the Bama. Phone, I want Bama. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. We're going to give them everything they want. All right, see you, bud. All right, good talking. All right, everybody, that's Keith Grayson, diehard Razorback fan, hilarious. Always enjoy having him on the show. Or does my primer keep coming up? There we go. All right. Where do we want to go next? I haven't really talked about the Bobby Petrino offense. I talked about it a little bit, you know, some of the stuff that I remember uh, happening with him. But from a, a personnel in, in, uh, standpoint, everybody keeps saying 47 transfer. I counted 48 on a 98-man roster. That's 49% of the roster who played at different schools, whether it's FBS, FCS, or uh, junior colleges uh, that have transferred to Missouri State. That's 22 players on the roster from FBS programs. That's D1, uh, including seven from Power 5 programs. That's not including their quarterback uh, who was at Utah, then was at Utah State, and now is at Missouri State. So the battle up front, they averaged 6'3", 305 per man, so not quite as big as what we're used to seeing on the offensive line, combined for 89 career starts up front on the offensive line. Uh, So they have a lot of experience with those guys. Um, obviously, I mentioned the journeyman quarterback, Jason Shelley, 5'11", 200, not, kind of slightly built, not, not as big as like quarterbacks you're used to seeing. Mountain Valley Football Conference Player of the Week last week and um, Mountain Valley Football Conference Player of the Year, Offensive Player of the Year, and Newcomer of the Year last season. Okay, last year he completed 20, 234 of 399 pass attempts. That's 58.6% for 3,352 yards, 22 touchdowns, nine interceptions. That's a 142.9 efficiency rating. He also ran 150 times, 155 times for 438 yards. That's 2.8 yards per carry, obviously, including sacks and stuff, and rushed for 10 uh, touchdowns. Originally from Frisco, Texas, he was ranked number 17 dual threat quarterback in the country when he signed with Utah coming out of high school. Right now, he's second in the Mountain Valley Football Conference with 281.5 passing yards per game, 37 of 54 for 563 yards, six touchdowns, with a conference-leading 68.5 completion percentage. So he's uh, significantly improved his completion percentage through two games versus what he did all of last year, and 192.8 efficiency rating, so that's outstanding. Jordan Jones plays there. Y'all remember Jordan Jones? Jordan Jones – is in his seventh year. So it's like the Dorian Gerald treatment. He's in his seventh year of playing college football. He was formerly number four overall prospect in the natural state, completed or caught 38 of 592. Caught, excuse me, caught 38 passes for 592 yards of four touchdowns over two seasons with Arkansas before he transferred to Cincinnati. Had 17 catches there and then um, had just two catches. Um, excuse me, had 17 catches for 188 yards with a touchdown over two seasons at Cincinnati and has two catches for 12 yards there. Kevon Latulis, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, Six foot two hundreds and other starties of convert, converted running back. He led them with 625 yards last year. They also got Tariq Owens, 6'3", 193, son of Terrell Owens. Terrell Owens, not Terrell, Terrell. NFL Hall of Fame wideout. Everybody remembers Terrell Owens. He, he came from Florida Atlantic, so another transfer. Raylan Sharp. Houston transfer, Lance Mason's a true freshman who caught three passes against UCA. And Ty Scott, listed as Ty Scott or Tyrone Scott, 6'3", 202, Central Michigan transfer uh, in 2019, who started 10, or excuse me, started 10 games at Central Michigan in 2019, 37 receptions, 650 yards, five touchdowns, 17.6 yards per catch. Uh, only played in the first two games the following year. Uh, before landing, transferring to Missouri State, where he has a school record last year, 66 receptions, a school record, 1,110 receiving yards, a school record, eight receiving touchdowns. So he's the guy to watch, Ty Scott. Obviously, George Jones be a guy to watch, too, since he's a former Razorback. I got some breakdowns on Arkansas's pass defense, but you guys know where Arkansas stands right now on pass defense. They got to improve in some areas, and I think they, I think the yardage total from the last game is a little bit misleading on how dominant the pass defense was. I say dominant, how good the pass defense was, because you also have to consider where they have six sacks in that game. That's part of the pass defense. Um, they only converted three of ten third downs, part of pass defense. Efficiency rating wasn't anything outstanding either. You know, a lot of that's desperation stuff. Some of it paid off through an interception in the end zone, took a safety in the end zone also, almost through another interception. You know, so there are some other things that, you know, you gamble a little bit, you produce a lot of yards, but you also make a lot of mistakes, and that's what happened. For their running back, uh, Jacardi Wright, six foot 220, 13 carries for 56 yards um, at Kansas State last season. So he's a Kansas State transfer. 
And he's been a good back for them. Through two games this season, 36 carries for 158 yards. He's yet to get into the end zone. Also caught a couple of passes, a few passes, 42 yards. Obviously, you know, we're thinking how they're passing the ball. So, how long have we gone here? 45 minutes? Y'all want to see if we got any good questions? Only taking good questions today. One more time, how to watch and listen. If you haven't thrown us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, go ahead and do so now. It would be a great time to do that. Uh, leave something. Let the other people know what to expect. And Hawk Sports is just $1 right now. Again, HAWGsports.com. There's no promo code or anything. You can sign up for just $1 or uh, 30% off for your first year. Two great options to sign up at Hogsports.com. Check out what we've got going on over there. I think if you read our reviews on Apple Podcasts, you'll see a lot of people who are leaving reviews are also leaving reviews for the website, and you can see what they expect or what they uh uh, feel they're getting out of the website as well. All right. Where do we want to go? Got a lot of predictions here. Cody L. James says, I hear a rumor that Nebraska could be trying to reach out to Browse and or Odom. Tell me that's it. Just a rumor. I think it's really early right now to see that. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, they did reach out to Odom. Maybe Browse too. I don't know. I think that, you know, Nebraska said they're probably going to want a guy who has been a sitting head coach. So we'll see. I still think it's a good job. I don't think it's as good a job as it used to be. But that's the same thing with Arkansas too, man. I mean, remember nobody wanted this job? I mean, if Pittman were to retire tomorrow, how many coaches do you think would say, hey, I want that job. I want the Arkansas job. But when Chad Morris was the coach, nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted the job. That's why they ended up, you know, it fought, fell to Pittman because nobody wanted the job. It, you know, I see all these things about what's the best job in college football. You know, Clemson's this great job. I'm sure Clemson's a great job. It's not the same job without Dabo Sweeney. Alabama is a great job, obviously. It's not the same job without Nick Saban. I think just raw potential, LSU is probably up there. I mean, they don't have to compete with anybody else in the state. they got the facilities, all that stuff. I mean, they produce more talent per capita than anywhere else. Maybe that's the best job in college football. But it all depends on how things are perceived through the coach. People looked at Arkansas and said, that's where coaches go to die. Pittman's not dying. He's thriving. He looks better than he's ever looked in his life. Trimmed up, feeling good, running a good program, feeling good about it. I mean, Arkansas is desirable to me. And Nebraska, um, it just depends. I mean, it just depends on how things are. I, I think a lot of people are surprised that the Scott Frost situation didn't work out, but it didn't. I mean, you go back and look also at Scott Frost's history as a head coach. It's not, like, extensive before he took the Nebraska job. They went undefeated at UCF one year. You know, it, same thing with Missouri. Is Missouri attractive? Is Drinkwitz, is that looking back? I mean, he had one year as a head coach. They had a great year, but that's it. That's all he's done as a head coach. Now we're kind of seeing, was that a great hire? I mean, I thought Drink, Drinkwitz is, I mean, in his last press conference, he kind of blamed, like, kind of took some shots at fans. Dude, never, never go after your fans. Never. That's the sign of, that's a bad sign when you're like kind of talking noise about your fan base. But Odom and Browse aren't going to be at Arkansas forever. They're just not. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me to see either one of those guys um, not with Arkansas next year just because they'll have opportunities. Arkansas is doing good. They're the coordinators. They're going to have opportunities. They both have opportunities last year. Browse had a, you know, Miami offensive coordinator position if he wanted it, and Odom gets courted for, you know, F FCS or uh, not FCS, but a uh, group of five jobs all the time. It's just he's looking for the right spot. Mike Carter says he really likes Debanian best footwork since Alex Collins. Yeah, he's got really good footwork. I agree with that, Rocky. I think we're going to see less of him, though, with Dominic coming on. Getting ready. Bill Richards says, hey, from Texarkana, love the show, especially the walk and talk. Keep up the great work. I appreciate that. Thanks for everybody for watching and making everything so popular that we do. I mean, I never would have thought when I started doing this that, you know, the show is kind of taking a life of its own. I just did the show really to promote the website. That was why I started. But now it's the show's kind of – it's it's changed. I mean, it's become its own thing. So I really appreciate that. Brandon – the Bolt says, watch the BYU game that worries me more than Bama. Their crowd was crazy and never left the stands. Great crowd, great environment. I watched that game too. And um, the thing that stood out to me about BYU, not that they have like 
just tremendous athletes. It's just that they're so sound and seem to always know where they're supposed to be. Also a really big offensive line, like one of the bigger offensive lines that Arkansas will face. Um, that's a very interesting game, just where it falls in the schedule and everything. But BYU, I w- if somebody said describe BYU, I would say fundamentally sound. That's how they feel to me. And not that Arkansas isn't fundamentally sound, but it's a lot of penalties right now. And that's something I think we look at with this game. Like, they got to clean up penalties. Absolutely have to clean up penalties in this one. Now, you would expect some stuff to happen, well, obviously procedure penalties and stuff when, you know, hopefully you get to a point where you get to play some backups and stuff. But for the starters and stuff, you'd just like to see a nice, clean game by those guys. Bob Petrino is a master of passing game. That does concern me. Other than that, it should be a paywall. I don't think they're going to be able to get over the discrepancy, the despair. What is the word I'm looking for? The divide, I guess, in talent. The, the, they're two different talent levels. There's not anybody on Missouri State team, um, you know, that could play at Arkansas. Maybe Jordan Jones since he did. That would be – I should say – rephrase that. There's nobody on that team that would start for Arkansas. Norman Hunt says, we do need to keep it classy. That being said, he did go a long way into cause and effect of us being laughed at and ridiculed for almost 10 years. Yeah, he did. I, I wasn't really laughing at Arkansas, though, and I don't think you were. I mean, it was just kind of depressing, wasn't it? I mean, I, I, I agree. I, that's how I look at it, like more disappointed than – Ha ha, you know, not funny. I mean, it was 10 years of, not 10 years, obviously, but eight years of, especially the last couple before uh, Pittman came on. Brandon Thibault, Thibault said, Hazelwood looked like one of the most physical players on the field, slamming the DB on the ground twice was nice to see. It, eventually he's going to do that to somebody and then run 50 yards for a touchdown. You know, he, he had a very low – Per catch average, I, I knew that they were going to throw a lot of screens and short stuff to him just because I saw it in practice. A lot of extra work on that stuff against South Carolina. Um, I just still don't feel like any of the wide receivers have broken out. Now, Matt Landers, we would be talking about him having broken out had he caught that long ball because he would have had like almost 100 yards receiving and a touchdown, five catches. But I don't feel like anybody's just broken out in that group. Landon Montgomery says, Will Anderson thinks Texas is the loudest venue. Let's change that. Razorback Nation. I mean, there may be venues that are equally as loud as what Arkansas was against Texas, but to me, I I, I don't know that anybody's just louder. I mean, I've been to I've been to every venue in the SEC. I've been to plenty of other venues. Um, what I saw with Arkansas versus Texas was right up there with any other venue that I've been to. So, yeah, do other, can other people make claims that their venue is this or that? Sure. Can somebody say, wow, they're so much better than Arkansas? Nobody can, in my opinion. I don't think so. Uh, I've been to Death Valley at night, and it's incredible. Equally as incredible as Arkansas versus Texas. But obviously a, a more Arkansas-leaning fan base, so it was different. Norman Hunt says, I think it will be like 55-10. Arkansas wins big, but be ranked – about the same in the next poll. Hopefully we don't look back. I mean, it just depends on what happens above. I haven't even looked at the games above them, but, I mean, I would think that think that Arkansas in both polls after this weekend is probably going to be in the top ten in both of them. They're already 10 in AP and 11 in the coaches, um, but have a chance to move up a little bit more. I mean, if you, if you can take care of this one and then beat Texas A&M next weekend, that Alabama game is – be a lot of eyes on that one. Let's see. A lot of people are talking about Nebraska, and they're not going to Nebraska and such. <laughs> Pick Keith up in the house. Uh, Tim Hudson wants to hang out with Keith. Am I wrong? Tim Hudson says, "Am I wrong for thinking that we can beat Texas A&M and Alabama back to back, or is that the Kool Aid talking?" You get Alabama at home. Obviously, it's very difficult to beat Alabama. That's obvious. But if you're going to have a chance to beat Alabama, like if I could rank the last, like if I could erase what I know happened and I could go back the last since, you know, 2007 and give Arkansas chances to beat Alabama, I might pick the 2017. 
first, and then maybe this one after that, maybe. I don't know. I mean, they've almost beaten them a few times. They almost beat them under Bielema, a one-point loss. They almost beat them under Petrino, a couple of interceptions there in the fourth quarter that cost them. Um, so they've been close before. But this is at home. Alabama has had some penalty issues. There's a chance. I don't say – I'm not going to say I'm going to pick Arkansas to beat Alabama until they do it. I'm just – I just don't – I'm not going to. But compared to past years, where does this rank on Arkansas's chances to beat Alabama? It's up there. Aaron Latham says, when coaches game plan, do they also adjust play calling to an extent of the recruits that are there? Probably not, but – I will say this, when Chad Morris was at Arkansas and Hudson Henry was on his official visit at Stanford, Arkansas threw a ton of passes to the tight end, and there was a reason behind that. Uh, Would I save Johnson for A&M, let him get a few – I think that – you let him get some good hits in this one. Let him get some good runs and to where he feels comfortable against Texas A&M. That's what I would – I wouldn't just throw him in. Mike Russell says students will be wearing neck braces to the game Saturday. I've heard that. Ken Paul says he likes the guests on the walk and talk. And that's not something we do. Josh Pate, you know, he's a buddy of mine. He does a fantastic job. You know, it's an opportunity for a little cross-promotion also. People see him on there. They're going to go check out. You don't know how many people I have that are um, fans of other teams that came to watch the walk and talk or, or watch stuff that are with us every single week since that since since Josh Pate mentioned that he watches the walk and talk, go check out our channel. Like I have Georgia fans, fans from all over the country that come and check out the walk and talk that aren't from Arkansas. So that's really cool. And, um, you know, I think that happened the other way when we had Josh Pate on. So sometimes it's good to do some – collaboration stuff it's not something that we plan to do a lot i understand that it, the walk and talk is just me and you you know we're having a conversation that's what it's supposed to be um i'm not going to say i won't have keith grayson on at some point though probably uninvited it's popping up the horns for the breakout player soon trey if a&m loses to miami and arkansas will jimbo get the boot i mean it's he has such a massive contract and buyout, but nobody's going to stand losing. I mean, he's no question underperformed. You can't lose. You can't lose to Appalachian State, a Sun Belt team, and what is this year four for Jimbo? I mean, this is when you're supposed to have the thing rolling, and it, by all indications, they are recruiting. You know, preseason rankings, all that stuff, they're rolling in that regard. But on the field, it's kind of ugly. And he's year four. I mean, they made an investment on him that just assuming that he's going to come in and make them the next Alabama. And that's not what's happening. Blanca Slusher says, I am speaking this into existence. We are beating both teams, Alabama and Texas A&M. All right, that's spoken out into existence, so it's there now. All right, everybody, I want to thank you for joining me. Next time we'll be with you, I'll be exiting Donald W. Reynolds Razorback Stadium, beautiful Donald W. Reynolds Razorback Stadium. Everybody likes when I says that. When I say that, uh, doing the walk and talk, and there will be no guest this time. So, join me on the walk and talk after this. Um, everybody's always like, "Where's the walk and talk?" Like immediately after. Well, I've got to go to a press conference. I've got to start writing some stuff. We've got other obligations and things like that. So we've got a lot of things that we've got to get to uh, first before we get to the walk, walk, walk and talk and exit the stadium. You have no, no idea how many people come up to me and be like, I love your walkabout. I love your talk and walk. You know, all that kind of stuff. But it's the walk and talk. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Thanks to Curtis Wilkerson for providing insight on uh, the Missouri State defense as well as Arkansas basketball. Thanks to Keith Grayson for giving us a little bit of a flashback of how he remembers things with the Bobby Petrino era and uh, some other comedic relief. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me. We'll be back with you guys on Saturday night. It'll be late, so a lot of you guys will be watching the Walk and Talk with your coffee. Uh, thanks, to everybody, for joining us. Sign up at hogsports.com if you haven't done so already. And this has been Trey Biddy with hogsports.com. And we'll catch you next time.